This is something that for Israel, from Israel's uh, communication in the world, is very important. important he also to talks about the rest of the world. Yes, and also talks about um, Hamas rejecting the ceasefire proposals. Also, this is one of the points that Israel has been trying to stress to the international community. And joining in conversation right now is I24 News correspondent in London, Jonathan Sashardati. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Jonathan, we already heard them talk about the UN, Human, the UN Human Rights Council today, and Hammond yesterday already made a statement that it won't achieve a lasting ceasefire, the Israel being investigated for this. Yes, yesterday, commenting on the resolution on Gaza adopted by the UN Human Rights Council, in which the UK, like some other EU nations, abstained. Uh, Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond said that the UK is deeply concerned by the continuing bloodshed in Gaza and that it's tragic that so many innocent civilians, including women and children, have been killed, just as he said again now in that press conference. But he said the urgent priority is to stop the bloodshed and restore a ceasefire and work for a longer-term solution. And to that end, he said that the UN Human Rights Council resolution will not help achieve a lasting ceasefire. He called it fundamentally unbalanced and said, quote, it will complicate the process by introducing unnecessary new mechanisms. So he was quite clear that the UK could not support that resolution, as he said. And he did say, though, that he recognised from the resolution the strength of feeling about the loss of lives and the desire by a large number of members of the Council to express that feeling in the resolution. So he said he'll continue to urge Israel to exercise restraint and make every effort to avoid civilian casualties and work for an immediate ceasefire. But even here in interviews on British television, when asked if he felt that Israel's actions have been disproportionate, a word used very often in discussion of Israel's activities in the Gaza Strip, he resisted answering that question and simply said over and over that he was urging the Israelis to make sure they minimize civilian lives, making no comment about whether he thought, in fact, they were doing that in an appropriate and proportionate way or not. And Todd, do you have any, we've heard this similar sentiment from Israeli politicians. We talked about it last night that the, in simple terms, basically saying you've got to be kidding us. And Jonathan has just mentioned it from Hammond as well. What are Israelis and anything for Jonathan about Hammond's position about this? Well, Israel was very appreciative of the uh, EU country's stand uh, regarding the UN uh, Human Rights Council vote yesterday. Um, this, of course, follows the very clear statement from the EU a few days ago regarding the call to disarm Gaza. But yesterday, also, Israeli officials in the Israeli foreign ministry did point out, look, all the EU countries did abstain. This is good for Israel. This is a good achievement for Israel. Um, in any case, Israel does treat the UN uh, Human Rights Council as a very anti-Israel biased arena to begin with. Israel this isn't did anything new. Not, totally not new. And Israel has also been through this process uh, just a few years ago following the Operation Castlet and the Goldstone Committee. But now there's a new battle, and uh, uh, maybe uh, Jonathan knows something about this, uh, but uh, um, the, the new battle is how to dictate uh, its uh, diplomatic work in the upcoming month, upcoming weeks, trying to uh, dictate who, what will be the mandate of the committee. This is very important to define where and what is the mandate of the inquiry. And two, the comprisement, the people who will be sitting in the committee. This is extra important to Israel. In the past, there have been very uh, harsh battles regarding who exactly will be the people sitting on the committee, what is their background, what is their views, where do they come from. Israel is definitely going to launch. A, a diplomatic battle into this. But in the end, Israel does know this has a diminishing effect on the position and standing in the world. And uh, um, Jonathan could probably say a lot about how recent, how the Goldstone report was uh, achieved all around the world, while in Israel it was definitely rejected very easily. And Jonathan, I want to come back to you. Protests both pro and anti Israel over the past week and a half in London. Can you give us uh, what's the atmosphere now in the streets of London? Anti-Israel protesters here do take to the streets during operations like this one in Gaza, and they can mobilize quite large numbers because they draw from groups on the far left and often also from Islamist Muslim groups. So it's not unusual for us when there's a military operation going on in Gaza to see those sorts of numbers. More unusual uh, are the 5,000 plus people who came to the streets outside the Israeli embassy the other day to show their support and solidarity with Israel uh, in a protest or rally that had a totally different mood. It was somewhat uh, sedate compared to those uh, more violent and more aggressive protests against Israel. And I think what's important now that we see again from what Mr. Hammond just said 
in the press conference is that while these things do go on in the streets from uh, admittedly large-ish fringe groups who have very strong political opinions, often urging Palestinians not to negotiate at all with Israelis, uh, Mr. Hammond, David Cameron and the government of the UK are in fact far more realistic and sensible about the prospects for peace and how they can be how that can be achieved over time mr hammond here saying that at the moment the uk is determined to help bring this current conflict to an end saying that he and david cameron have been clear that hamas started this and is in breach of international humanitarian law he said just now in that press conference in jerusalem saying again something that he and david cameron have echoed over and over throughout this current conflict that Israel has the right to defend itself and its civilians. But that doesn't stop him, like much of the international community, being what he calls gravely concerned about the level of civilian casualties and welcoming that Egyptian ceasefire proposal, again pointing out that Israel immediately accepted it after its security cabinet meeting when it was proposed, and Hamas rejected it. So it seems that David Cameron and Philip Hammond, in his new role as the British Foreign Secretary, are quite aware of the situation and how it is mapping out that even with the calls for ceasefires, it takes two to tango, as we say. And if Israel accepts a ceasefire proposal and Hamas does not, whether it be a long-term, medium-term, or even several-hour humanitarian ceasefire proposal, if only one side accepts it, there's no ceasefire at all. And Israel cannot be expected, it seems they are saying, to uh, cease firing when rockets are continuing to rain down on its population. And as we saw there, uh, sirens in central Israel, uh, in Tel Aviv, going off during that press conference in Jerusalem. Interestingly, the BBC, the main broadcaster here, didn't mention the sirens at all during their live feed from that conference. They simply showed the end of the conference, commented that there were no questions, and then cut back to the studio to follow other world news. So the sirens going off in places like Tel Aviv causing such disruption to people's lives are simply not being covered here because there are no casualties and there are no telegenic images of ruined buildings or, or injured civilians. And that, unfortunately, in terms of the PR war, sets Israel at a disadvantage despite the fact that the politicians are clear that it is defending itself against a formidable terrorist force which continues to rain down rockets onto Israel. Jonathan, you just said that the British media doesn't show the whole picture, and you mentioned earlier that the dominant force in the streets are the anti-Israel protesters. Is that the predominant feeling around London right now? It's very hard to gauge public opinion on these sorts of issues. YouGov, which is a respected polling company here, did conduct some research uh, in the last week or two about public opinion towards what's going on in Israel. And actually, it was somewhat surprising to the pessimists uh, in Israel about what's going on in the UK. Uh, it would be wrong to say there wasn't something to worry about there for the, uh, for the people of Israel. But it's uh, clear that actually they uh, noticed that the gap is closing between people who support the Israeli side of the narrative and people who support the Palestinian side of the narrative. And also they notice a growing number of people who seem to take uh, some sort of sitting on the fence view that they don't know whose fault it is. Uh, they condemn both sides for the ongoing, uh, the ongoing conflict. And that's really the truth about the public opinion here. It's very mixed and there's a minimal understanding of the complexity of what's going on owing to that rather poor press coverage here that doesn't really delve into the proper details properly represent both sides. Because by the nature of it, uh, this conflict uh, can look far worse uh, on one side because of those numbers of civilian casualties as a result of human shields and the like that we know uh, is creating a, a far higher death count on the Palestinian side. Jonathan Sashradari, thank you very much for joining us from London. And we just heard the sound of an alarm alert on a phone. I do believe it was coming from Jonathan's phone for the city of Sderot or the town of Sderot in southern Israel. And earlier this morning, the Brit